Hi, Giovanni. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, guys. <laughs> and uh, maybe we can start by uh, telling us a few things about how you started Unimatic and uh, yeah, what you did. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, me and my business partner, Simone, we are trained as industrial designer at Politecnico di Milano. And uh, in a nutshell, we started the Unimatic in 2016. Uh, after uh, practicing the industrial design craft uh, in furniture and visual and stuff like that, basically just because uh, we were passionate about uh, watches and uh, we were uh, collectors, I mean small scale collectors because we were young and uh, not very aware of what was going on around us. But uh, <coughs> because of the, the mindset of being uh, trained as industrial designer uh, we basically were going into you know the details of the vintage pieces that we can afford uh, and uh, in a way criticizing uh, constructive criticizing uh, you know i would have done this in this way not that way and stuff like that so at some point, uh, we had the chance to find a supplier that was uh, ready to, to do a small batch of something that we had in mind since the time of the university. And this, uh, I mean, I left Polytechnico maybe in 2006, so it took like 10 years of uh, measuring and looking around and trying this, trying that. And then uh, we did it. We did our own watch. That was supposed to be some kind of a, a side project on top of our regular day job and uh, some kind of a playground in which to experiment what we have thought about watch design. And uh, it happened to be enjoyed also by somebody else. And then we are here, basically. And uh, now the company is still is super small. We are... Uh, I mean, a company with uh, like five employees based here in Milano, and we produce less than 10,000 pieces for a year. So we are like a dwarf in a giant kind of uh, market. But I think this is also a little bit your angle of like producing limited edition series and like doing things small scale um, yes, and more curated, yes. uh, right? This started from a constraint that we had because we didn't have, you know, millions or business plan or investors to put in, in place to do, you know, big scale operation. And we started out like that. And for some reason, still nowadays like this, we started doing a unique edition, meaning that still today our focus is on uh, doing um, some kind of once and done uh, uh, capsule mm -hmm. all in a row with some collapse and stuff like that but uh, the core still today that uh, we get i don't know 20 times bigger than in the beginning or something but still it's uh, it works like that for us so it's about uh, <coughs> trying to evolve uh, somehow the, the design and some principle that we want to bring on uh, release after release to do something hopefully better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, since you mentioned the design, I was wondering if you can share a few things about, because it has a very particular design and it's very minimalist in a way, and could you share a little bit more about yeah, the uh, development? Well, the relation with design, I think it comes Mm, first and foremost from our background because both me and Simone we were trained as industrial designer so we basically still have uh, very little to no skills in running a business even if it's small and so we look at this from the angle of an industrial designer and uh, mm, the, 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 the concept uh, of doing watch design was uh, challenging and uh, enticing for us because uh, uh, if you think about watch, it's uh, some kind of a very 
accomplished item, uh, but it's a very completed item, meaning that, uh, you know, there are uh, at least 100 years of incremental improvement and polishing and refining and trials and errors that, of course, we didn't do, but somebody else on our behalf, they did it. So there are a number of constraints, plus we do mainly diving watch, so there is also some technical uh, aspect that need to be there. Mm -hmm. So it was challenging. And in a way, for a person like me, this is the, the best way to put my brain to work. Uh, and these uh, somehow trace the road that we are still uh, doing. Uh, I can, I know my talking is a little bit messy, but that's the way I work. But to give you an example, it's like uh, if you think of a hammer, in a way, I feel the watch is a little bit like this because uh, the hammer, uh, you know, it works with uh, a heavy head, a shaft that uh, handle, I don't know how to say in English, but uh, something that must be appropriate length and solid enough. And then uh, nowadays, hammer designer, if any, of course, they can get crazy with colors and materials and trims and this and that. But in the end of the day, if you want to hammer to work, you have to play by the rule of uh, hammerness. And this is a very rough and basic concept, but uh, it's what uh, is the like fundament of the design grammar that we choose and uh, that we try to build on mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. The, design link somehow it's something like this for me right uh, I mean behind us we're seeing a lot of the collections you've done and uh, yeah. a lot of collaborations as well with uh, companies or artists and so on so I was wondering if you can tell us a few of those yes. uh, let's say that uh, the, the work that we try to, to do since the very beginning because uh, as I told you it was a uh, more a game than a business plan, what led us here. Uh, it was to try to deconstruct to, to bits that we can later uh, try to reassemble in a meaningful way. And uh, when doing so, uh, for uh, many reasons, one of that is also just to have fun while doing it. Uh, we try somehow to hybridize the DNA and this uh, basic concept that, in our opinion, must stay there with somebody else. So we started, uh, that was just uh, from commercial reason, in a way, with Colette, that was our first retailer. And uh, because we were naive, we didn't thought that they needed a large quantity. So the guy came up from, with the idea of doing a unique edition just for them, 50 pieces. So Went quite an good. iconic store uh, right now. I mean, it's, yeah, it's that a was big... a dream because yeah. uh, we couldn't imagine that we would have been actually able to sell. And we weren't sure at all that somebody else out there uh, was going to, to like what we were doing. Yeah. And after these, uh, many other piled up organically in a way, and so, I mean, from a human perspective, beside business, that is the most uh, exciting thing because we are uh, now, I mean, now and also since the very beginning, we were able to connect to a number of persons that, to a small guy from Chiavenna, they were so far and completely unreachable. Mm -hmm. You know, Miara Yasuiro, that is this... Uh, avant-garde, uh, crazy designer from Japan, or uh, undefeated, uh, NASA, uh, Luisa Viaroma when talking fashion, uh, Norwegian rain guys that do uh, outerwear in Norway with Japanese tailoring style, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, we have a vast panel of collab that we did, and uh, all of them uh, are, uh, in a way, our uh, 
try to hybridize the DNA and the, the concept that I was speaking about with something new and something different. And then, of course, at the same time, we have our own, uh, let's say, seasonal collection mm -hmm. in which we pick a team. We try day by day and drop by drop to refinish and polish and possibly to come with something that people will uh, enjoy as much as we did uh, while designing it. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's uh, main question is why would you buy a watch when we have smartphones now to look at the time when it's not a necessity anymore but rather an yes. accessory? This is the, where the deeper talking starts. <laughs> But uh, before this, uh, uh, I need to put some figure for uh, people that is not in the watch business to understand. Because in 2021, the traditional old school watchmaking altogether was a $49 billion market. That is something. And... Uh, even with smartphones, smartwatches, and stuff, is growing 2.5%. 2.5% of 49 million, it's 1.2 million or something. So it's uh, something that you cannot just skip and consider, uh, okay, that's old stuff nobody wants. Plus, uh, all of these data are from some McKinsey report, so you should just trust me. Valid. Uh, yeah. Uh, the 23 or something percent of smart uh, watches user, they still wear a second traditional watch. And uh, now this is a trend, um, legitimate or not, but 20% uh, of the watch buyer consider the watch buying as an investment. In my own perspective, then maybe I can be wrong, but... Uh, in a way, this applies to everything, but particularly to watches. Uh, items, objects, like Baudrillard would have said, uh, they have more a symbolical meaning than the functional aspect of those. So, in a way, you could tell the human life altogether the mankind history and the relationship uh, just going through the object that this or that era produce. And watches, uh, to me, of course, it's not a broadly shared opinion, but uh, they have uh, many good uh, reasons to be interpreted uh, as uh, some kind of a multifaceted prism in which uh, you have so many different layers of meaning and uh, everybody can look at this from different angles and uh, they can focus on specific quality that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, these are, uh, again, when I think about because uh, I mean, beside any business consideration, but uh, I ask myself why I'm passionate about watches and not uh, a coffee table or chairs or uh, flowers. Uh, there is a number of um, elements that converge and uh, bind together in this. So um, I try to keep it short because we can speak for hours about this. But uh, uh, number one, you have uh, like the human struggle to measure time. Uh, I mean, 5,000, uh, 500 years ago or something, you had the Egyptian obelisk, yeah. and uh, people trying to measure time with the shadow that the obelisk casted on the ground. And then this evolved into proper sundials. And again, this is like sundials, proper sundials is like 3,500 years ago. Earlier, there were these uh, sundials, very inaccurate, and then uh, sunglasses, clesidre, I don't know how to say sunglasses, yeah? And then hourglass, hourglass, thank you. And uh, 
then clocks powered by candle, by water, by you name it, until at some point, mankind was able to come up with a proper man-made uh, technology to measure time. And uh, in a way, this was a, a, a way to bend and to tame physic law to a scope. Mm -hmm. So it's an achievement for humanity. And in a way, it's also a blink of an eye of order in the complete chaos of the universe. So uh, a guy like me and many others, thanks God, they cannot help but being fascinated by this, <laughs> that we can come up with you know, these wheels and spring yeah. and stuff like that, uh, that obey physical law, but show time to us. And so it's a quest for order in a way. And then uh, another thing to consider uh, is that time, it's uh, politically democratic and uh, wide uh, accepted, meaning that uh, no matter what you care or not care about watches, but you still have to deal uh, with time. And times goes the same way for the, the beautiful, for the ugly, for the poor, for the rich, for anyone. Uh, and also have been uh, the display of time and this measurement has been product play somewhere, somewhere uh, important, you know, staples, mm -hmm. tower, main square building, uh, since centuries and centuries, even before now getting on smartphones, on watches, or anything. It's a, it's a current topic for uh, anyone deep in, in their heart. The, the watch, in my opinion, has a lot of layers of meaning. Plus, there are a secondary or a third grade or fourth grade level of meaning that can be um, getting from uh, you know, the fact of a watch being binded to some uh, historical moment or a specific function. You know, you have a diving watch, aviator watch, uh, medical watch, sport watch, uh, architect watch, you name it. And uh, so with a simple tool that you put on your wrist, you can send out a message. And then the next day you can swap it. So easier than getting a tattoo or uh, dyeing your hair much easier to fit in that some nice dress or something. It's uh, easy and uh, you also have some hidden partner because uh, all of the big brands with their uh, you know, pharaonic marketing initiative and endorsement and product placement in movie, they will help uh, you and uh, the audience to which you are uh, either you want it or not speaking to understand what you want to, to show with this watch. Mm -hmm. So, at the end of the day, to me, even if you don't need to read the time, or maybe you don't need to read the time altogether unless you are a nine to five employee, uh, the concept is that uh, it's a postmodern item that just speaks for its uh, symbolism, in a way. Great. Well, um, we can open the floor for questions if there are any. Uh, thank you so much, by the way, for the detailed presentation. Anyone? So you are a designer, you are an entrepreneur, you come up with a, with the ultimatum of the watch, the best watch you can imagine, and you have a playground, you can... Uh, for this uh, yeah. You can a little bit uh, modify things. But then um, you ask for collaboration, you imagine uh, people who could, in a way, take your watches and put something of their own research into it. For example, collaboration with artists. Yeah. Uh, what is the criteria of reaching those people? Do, do, do you, I mean, how, 
how do you plan these releases? And as far as I know, they're limited editions. So how also the limited edition comes into place and the choice of the people you are doing collaborations with? Uh, it's going to be a disappointing answer <laughs> because uh, uh, since the beginning and still nowadays, we are a very passive kind of company. So all of the things, and there are many, very nice, that happened, they happened without us being on the lookout for this to happen. So uh, I can tell you Miara Yasuiro, uh, the guy is some uh, full crazy avant-garde Japanese designer, but like avant-garde also for your taste, Birgit, for example. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we have no idea why in London catwalk in 2016 he come you know after the model to say hi to everyone with some unimatic watches out of the blue sky so I text him and I said oh thank you because this is like the first time that somebody that is you know young and famous and legitimate fashion designer use our watch on his own wrist without, you know, having, of course, being paid or anything. And uh, this led to a conversation in which we find some common ground that is uh, completely unexpected. Because uh, you, Birgit, you know me even before tonight. So, you know, I'm like a simple guy from the mountain what I could share with this uh, visionary genius from uh, Shibuya or something. Almost nothing, but we share the love for watches. And so we can connect through watches and through especially uh, details that would be considered as plain stupid by the 99.9% .9 of the rest of the humanity. So we get this connection and we started talking about this and then we did it. And uh, likewise, uh, we did uh, Undefeated, that is this big uh, streetwear brand. Again, just randomly, we get connected because, uh, I mean, the Undefeated CEO or something uh, is a watch collector. He bought uh, one of our editions uh, in a shop in Japan and he didn't know anything about us, but he bought it just, uh, you know, like an impulse buying. Then he come home, look at it uh, and say, ah, I see something good. Maybe I should reach out. So there is no planning. There is uh, just a uh, thing happening. And uh, until today, we are uh, like on a chain uh, of good luck that I wish doesn't break tonight. <laughs> thank you so much for joining you, us. Sophia. And uh, thanks, thanks to everyone for joining the Daily Bar, as this was our last talk.